Welcome to the Cultivating Success Podcast. Jeff Sofer and Jonathan Wolfson are brothers and business partners of the top landscaping company, Nature's Experts. Nature's Experts is home to six companies that cater to all your outdoor needs. To learn more about Jeff and Jonathan, simply visit us at www.naturesexperts.com. On the podcast, Jeff and Jonathan bring together other business owners and entrepreneurs to share with you how they developed a prosperous company and how you can too. You will gain insights and meaningful advice on creating the building blocks to success and longevity in the entrepreneurial realm. And now, here are your hosts, Jeff Sofer and Jonathan Wolfson. All right. Uh, Cassandra, thank you for joining us today on the Cultivating Success Podcast. This has already been very exciting with my uh, character that's next to me. This is Jeff. He's one of the cast of characters in the show today. And we have Cassandra. So thank you for joining us today. Jeff and Jonathan, I have a feeling this is going to be a wild ride for us today, but all is well. Bumpy. So, uh, Jeff hello. must be in one of those moods. Bumpy ride. <laughs> so hello to those of you who I have not met in the past, which is pretty much your entire audience. Uh, my name is Cassandra Rosen. I am the owner and co-founder of FK Interactive, a brand architecture and public relations consultancy based in Central Florida, specifically in Winter Park. I am one of those rare breeds of Florida natives, unlike the rest of my family. I don't like snow, so I've stayed here and they left. But our business exists because we have found that over the years, as there's more and more automation within the world, people are really beginning to crave a human touch and a human element, even when it comes to their interactions with businesses. They want to feel seen and they want to feel understood and heard. And that is why what we do, which is help businesses and brands to humanize their message and to really create a verbal identity that connects with people so that those businesses are able to make more impact, be able to create more purpose, and also in the end, create more profit for their businesses. So that's I like that. what I do. Well, who doesn't like to make more profits? So I Great. think let's dig in first to how do you really help someone who doesn't really have a personal brand established yet? Well, that's a good question. And before I get into that, I am going to explain why it is that I'm dressed in braids and this vest because it is Star Wars Day. And as part of my personal very nerdy brand, I ran a poll on LinkedIn and voted. And it was basically dress up as a Tauntaun, dress up as a Wookiee, or try to actually look like the human. And I kind of went for the thing that wasn't quite such a gigantic costume that I wouldn't fit on camera. So if you have Star Wars fans in the audience, I'm going to wish them a happy May the 4th. Well, I am Star Wars fans. And it's so <laughs> funny that you saying you're dressed up. Jeff, a few weeks ago, wore a wig to a party. I did. It was a George Washington wig. However, I think the Star Wars thing, as much as I liked it when I was young, I think it's silly to have a day after. And who thinks that someone coming from somebody who wore a George Washington wig? You really have to pick it in for what it's worth. It's a little ridiculous to me. It's it's actually just pre Cinco de Mayo celebrations is kind of how I look at it. So when we talk about my background, then you'll understand why the Cinco de Mayo thing is so big. So when it comes to a a business or a person that doesn't have a personal brand, from my perspective, every business owner is a personal brand, whether you want to take ownership of it or not. So a business is obviously its own brand, its own entity in and of itself, but you are a person. You have a digital reputation out there in the, on the internet, whether you're taking ownership of that message or you not. You mean what you look up, what your searches are, like that what you're talking about? Well, it can be that, but it can also be something that's a little bit deeper. It's actually your opinions on things, your point of view, um, the values, the things that you stand for or against, because chances are, even though you may be distinct and separate as a person from right. your business or for you guys, all of your businesses, there's a reason why you created each of them. And there's a reason why you do what you do. There's a reason why you put your dollars into certain things when you're making purchases as a business owner, but maybe not other ones. And there's a reason why you may donate to certain causes, for example, versus other ones. And all of those things are basically facets of a personal brand that you can leverage for good, or you can basically do nothing and let the internet and the world just think whatever it is that you'd like them to think. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? It totally makes sense. I feel like if you're going to have a personal brand, not a business brand, but if you're going to have a personal brand, if you stand for nothing, no one's going to really care. So you got to pick a side and you don't have to be completely polarizing, but it is important that everyone does know what your particular position is on not everything, 
but maybe whatever is important to you specifically. Right. Well, and the thing is, when you do that, what we have found, and this is this is what's so fascinating, is for us with our business, um, with our agency side of things, we actually focus very heavily on consumer products and more specifically on the wine and spirit space. Those are products. They're bottles on the shelf. They don't have voices. They can't talk. They can't speak. The best they can do is have social media presences, maybe advertise, depending on who the brand is and what they want to do with that, and occasionally have people pour in, you know, whether it's shots or samples in a store. They can't speak to something, but they are all technically solutions to someone's problem. The question is for who and what, and what does that look like to that person? So for you as an individual or even as a business, when you're able to communicate that here's what who I am, here's what I stand for, and here are the things that I care about, what happens is whether that's you as an individual or you representing your company, people begin to become attracted to that. And I think COVID is a huge example of of that on a global scale. But as companies started reacting and or not reacting to certain things with their businesses, customers and consumers started making choices. And they started saying, hey, I align with this brand or I don't align with this brand. And it's all of those. that's really trickled down yet that people are actually using their dollars with people that they actually genuinely connect with? Oh, I think 100%. Or do you think that it's, it's going in that direction? I think it depends on, A, if that business is putting it out there, and B, it depends on the consumer and obviously the the product that you're looking at. So to me, what a really phenomenal and very interesting example of this is is the Marriott brand. And Marriott is, is a brand of brands, right? I mean, they have hundreds of brands all over the world under their brand umbrella. But Marriott has made it a point over the past, I would say, 10 to 15 years to really double down on what it is that they stand for as an organization, their core values, um, the beliefs that they have, the uh, support that they have for like DEI, diversity, inclusion, um, and also what they stand for with their employees. And what's very interesting is that has trickled down in a lot of ways for consumers making purchasing decisions. It's not that, you know, Ritz Carlton may be for one person, but then there's their Andaz Hotel brand many years ago that's a totally different concept. Because Andaz is all about local. It's all about supporting sustainability. They're, you know, they're shopping local, they're buying local, whatever's fresh in season versus, you know, Ritz Carlton. When you think about that brand, that's it's a luxury brand. It's a different experience that that consumer is looking for. So it's they're making the choice, but the choices are very nuanced and different depending I think on. We're in like the beginning stages of it because, like, you know, there's things that technology has made things really easy and convenient. And yeah. that's like at the forefront of things. And now as technology is settling into its permanent place in people's like lives and how they actually use it, yeah. I think that's when actually now where it's like, all right, well, it's it's great, of course, to get my package from Amazon tomorrow, tonight, whatever. Sure. You know, at a certain point, then you're starting to care more about why am I particularly buying the item and then who am I buying it for? And I think as just the world is starting to uncover so many different things, people are starting to analyze different things in a different way yeah. where it's more important how they spend their money or who they spend it with, if they're going to spend it even. But I think we're like in the very infancy stages where I don't think there's really been a huge cultural shift yet, but I think that it probably will come in like the next five years. But I don't think it's entirely there yet. I think there's too many people who want things too convenient. Well, and that, I was actually going to say that, that is a perfect example because it's all about what can that brand at the end of the day do for me as a consumer. So my values for sustainability may not be up here, but I'm looking more at convenience as being something that's up here. My sustainability priorities might be down here. And I think, again, going going back and looking at COVID, at least from our perspective, we saw a massive rise in single surf products. Why? Because we were all stuck at home. And the only thing we could do, we couldn't go out to restaurants, we couldn't go to bars, we couldn't go travel. So people were creating these experiences out of home. And what we saw with our own clients, as well as just across the board was people were looking for what can I take with me while I'm on the go? Because I want to be outdoors, I want to be enjoying nature, I want to be, you know, whether it's camping, glamping, whatever that might be, they want to be doing something as an activity. And then that brand needs to find a way to fit into the lifestyle. So it's a very different way of making choices. And you're absolutely right. I don't think that, you know, as much as I'd love to say that sustainability is going to be what everyone's going to go for, 
because we should. Well, some people are always going to choose convenience though. Like they're exactly. never going to actually have a brand like, you know, favorite right. or something because they just want whatever is convenient. Sure. Absolutely. And that's their priority. So you have to look at, okay, as a business, if I'm marketing to my customer, what does my customer prioritize? It's my it's, customer That's why you have to pick your customer so you know what your customer base well, is actually. And but companies also like, I mean, as far as a brand go, look what looks what look what happened to um to Anheuser Busch. I mean, they chose a stance, they chose to do something, and look what happened. I mean, it's it was not the right choice. Yeah. A lot of yeah. people well, said that's not, not that's that's something though that they can rebound from because it's convenient and things that are convenient. There can be obviously a detriment to the stock, to the sales, but at the end sure. of the day, it's sold at every single street corner and eventually they'll do whatever they need to do to sell more beer, liquor, whatever that they're selling because it is a business ultimately. But Absolutely. It's interesting. Yeah, but it's interesting because you think that a company like that, that's been around for so long, that has so much power and such a big market share, they sort of probably felt like we can choose and do whatever we want. We can continue to, you know ring the bell of whatever we want in society because, you know, we have all this power and all this market share and they were taught a lesson. And at the end of the day, they probably just hired a marketing agency that said it was a really good idea and they paid them a, you know, good chunk of change and said, Hey, it sounds like a good idea yeah. aligns with our brand values and we're going to take this risk. And sometimes risks pay off. Yeah. And sometimes, and they, sometimes they don't. They it's calculated don't. a lot of times. It's so yeah. interesting. Something like that, particularly just because you're all inclusive, to anybody to be your customer and you're happy for anybody to be customer and you're happy for your customers to choose doesn't mean that it aligns with the majority of your customers to put it out there like it's of a top importance. Right. Because particularly- like The center of your brand. Needs yeah, to like it that. doesn't, Yeah, it's fine if you feel that way, of course, and you want to be inclusive to those people, but making a like, you know, distinctive ad that's directed towards a very small minority to speak up as in it's a- very, very important thing. I feel like that's really where we're talking about personal brands. You have to be selective with what you want your messaging to be possibly, because if you're very much into, you know, politics, for example, then fine, be into politics, but like every, you can't, don't be on like, don't make your talking points, like the smallest nuances that are like the most absolutely offensive. Why don't you keep her on like the, the yeah. broader subjects yeah. that more generalize towards people of that particular group that you're looking to direct towards. Well, and that's the, that's the thing, especially for, you know, when we're talking about legacy brands, whether it's Bush or it's Coca-Cola or it's Marriott or anything like that, you've got to look at, okay, who's your customer base? And your customer base for them isn't even just the United States. It's not just, you know, Americans, they're a global brand and they have to look and say, okay, as a global brand, how far can I push the envelope? How far can I push if I want to, you know, basically, am I just, you know, I mean, there's, you know, am I rainbow washing? Am I green washing by doing this? Or am I actually doing something that matters to something that I've determined is a priority within my business? And that's really the key, whether you're talking about a personal brand or you're talking about a business brand, it's defining ways to speak to your customer in a way that helps them understand that you're the best choice not just from an ad hoc perspective, because we can throw all the gimmicks at them and all the one-liners all day, but they need to understand, okay, how are you a better solution than the guy down the street? And especially if we're a service provider versus, you know, a product, we really have to understand how to communicate that value. And then if we're, if we're a product, then we have to understand, okay, where are our customers buying? Are they just coming to our online store and buying? Are they buying from somewhere else? Because now your brand kind of has to integrate with that retailer's brand and how figure out how, been, how long have you been doing this for? So I have been in branding since 2012. And do you okay. like it? I love it. I really do. It seems really. like you love it. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell I nerd out on this? I, uh, I had a conversation. I want to say it was probably I feel like year. she's out of this world, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. With this ridiculous okay. holiday today. <laughs> yeah. She's out of this world. Yeah. <laughs> I, I had a conversation many, many years ago with a, actually it was a, a friend of mine who hosts a podcast and he, he said, what's the one thing that you feel like you could talk about a hundred or thousand times yeah. and not get bored? And that's, that for me is the power of brand because it comes brand through, it comes through and how you're, you know, talking about your business and talking about other companies and talking about it, do, it does come through with that, which is nice. To me, a powerful thing because 
it's almost like the cheat code in a video game, right? When you're trying to figure out how do you unlock the next level and don't like go deep on video games because I'm just using this as a brief analogy. I'm a nerd, but <laughs> horrible at them. But the thing is when you understand how to speak your customer's language, you pay less for advertising, sales gets easier, and they start becoming automatically attracted, which to me, that's like, you know, that's the magic potion because that's so how, how do you, you really customers. connect, for example, you know, someone has a personal brand as right. an owner or even an employee to their business and their business is, let's just say their media presence is standard, for example, right? You know, generic yeah. speaking to the customer. What you're saying is how do you get traction? What do you do as a as a, someone who has a personal brand that wants to help their business, whether they're in it or they own it, and right. the, the brand of the business is considered standard, for example, standard practice. It's explaining their product or service that they're doing in a very neutral manner. How do you- law firm. I mean, let's get real. Most law firms are like super boring, right? Okay. So <laughs> if you know a really exciting, entertaining lawyer, please let me know because I have yet to, to meet them. So- the way that you start doing that, at least the way that I have found really works, it, is it depends on what you're trying to do, right? So what's the end goal? Are we trying to raise brand awareness and become known for a thing? Are we really trying to aim this, frankly, because we want to make more sales? We want to scale, which I hope should be the goal. You should be doing both, not just like, I really want to do this because I want to do this, which is probably what Bush kind of did. So you start looking at your, at your you, data. Say you work for a company and you're really just very proud about working there and think that you guys do a great job and you're trying to help increase sales, but you're sure. just like a proud employee, you know? Sure. So if the boss let you, one of the first things would be, okay, for understanding company values is going to be the big thing. But I would start at the ownership level before I start started allowing my employees to start sharing stories on behalf. Well, start That's start at the ownership level. Say you're Jeff, for example. No, Jeff, you know? if I were Jeff, what I would do is I would say, okay, let me look at the books and figure out, okay, out of all of my companies, because you're, you're multipreneurs, right? You've got a lot of businesses going, you've got a lot of things happening. So the question is, where is the priority? Because chances are there's some core priorities either within one of the businesses or, or all of them. And we start looking, okay, where's the money coming from? Who's the ideal customer? And then we start profiling that customer out to say, okay, what are the things that customer cares about? And if you do some digging, frankly, you can actually find this on Google. And then you start finding, okay, where's your common thread across all of your customers? What do more of them care about? And are these things that I also care about? And that's how you start connecting the money to your personal brand, because you can create your story first, right? And a lot of people do that. They'll say, I'm going to do my brand story. I'm going to do all of this. Well, the problem is if your story doesn't connect with what the crap your customers care about, but, you're lost. But once you've identified that, so right. that's good. You identify that. Once you identify that, I said the word to John a few minutes ago. So then how do you get traction with it? So then the next question is, where are they hanging out? Are they on Facebook? Are they Instagram? Are they on LinkedIn? Are they on TikTok? Like where are they on YouTube? Where are they? And then- and What if they're not on social media? What if they're hanging out not on social media? Chances are they're on social media. If my grandmother was on social media- until she was, until she passed at, you know, the age of 93, I am sure chances are your customers are on social media. Right. Jeff, right. The, the stigma is that older people are on Facebook, younger people are on, and middle-aged people are on Instagram, younger people TikTok. are on TikTok, business yeah. professionals are on LinkedIn. That's yeah. the general yeah. stigma of got all it. of it. Got it. Absolutely. They all have their place in their, their category. Got Absolutely. It. So you've got to say, okay, where are my people? And then if you don't have an audience there, if you don't have a presence there, then how can you leverage other people's audiences? And that's where, to me, the beauty of podcasts comes in. So for you guys, for example, you know, I know one of your companies is um, you're doing luxury landscaping. I think it's down in the Palm Beach area. Yes. Yes. So the question is, okay, who are those clients? Who are those clientele? How old are they? You know, what do they do for a living? If you, if you know, Chances are, you know, you can go online and do a quick search and you'll find your customers online. And I know this because we've done this for our clients. Even when they didn't have customers, we went out and looked at their competitors and we said, okay, who's the competitor in this space? Who was following them? And then what other entities, whether it's media, podcasts, online publications, what have you, where else is that audience? And how can I find a way to get my brand, my business and my story in front of that audience so that the people that could be my customers 
can potentially see me and hear me and understand that I'm for them. Does that make sense? It makes sense. And then once you do that, which I feel like we've done that, once you do that, then you need to be able to I don't, convince I don't them think, to I don't buy think, and go with your service. I don't think we buyer. have particularly. I think we're still trying to figure it out because there's different channels that work at different times, you know? I, I don't agree with him. I think we have put our name in front of a lot of people, in front of a lot of is it potential clients. And well, that's, my, that's my question is just then because you put working, your though. name, I didn't say that it was working. I said, we put ourselves in front of them. Then my question was, you started talking. My question to her was, how do you make that work? So you put it in front of them. Then what do you do? I yeah, mean, obviously you're going to say, well, sell your service, sell your products. But you can't, even if you're a good salesperson, even if you're someone who knows how to sell, knows how to show solutions for someone's problems, they still these days don't just go with you no. because they're, what I have found, and this is a really important point I think for people to listen to is, even if you show them very clearly, this solves your problem. We are the answer to what you are currently having an issue with. They still may not change, even though they know that you're best, because people right now have what I may call just like a hesitation factor. They don't even know why they're hesitating. They yeah. just don't want to change anything. Even if they know that what they're doing, it's a detriment to them. Absolutely. So Absolutely. what do you do to get them to disregard that hesitation and do what they know that they should be doing? What do you do? So you don't necessarily target them. You target a lookalike that's similar to them that hasn't necessarily dug in their heels and refused to change. Because okay. here's the thing, trying to change consumer behavior, I don't care what business you're in. I don't care if you're in alcohol, if you're in landscaping, if you have a law firm, if you're a technology company, anytime you're trying to change behavior, it's going to be very, very, very hard and very expensive to get someone to break that pattern. And what's happened with COVID, and this happens during wartime, you can actually go and look statistically at like what happens to people's mindsets and their, and their psychology when they've gone through this really, really stressful event. They don't want change. They want comfort and they want security. And they don't care if it's costing them money. They don't care if it's hurting them. They don't yeah. care if it's not actually solving a problem. Just what I said. Just what I, yeah. what I was saying. Yeah. Absolutely. They have made their decision and chances are they're probably going to be a really hard person to become an early adopter or even a, you know, mid-range adopter for your business. So you but have to seek out. Odd, continuously like, seek out like, those audiences. You, you, yes. Right. Got it. So not yeah. like-minded, but look alike well, sort so, of clients so Jeff, to, to that me, don't have the same mindset. So right. I'm going to, I'm going to give into more of what Jeff is directly referring to. Okay. So Jeff is getting a lot of referrals from contractors referring us yeah. to customers. And they have very strong opinions. What she is saying, Jeff, is that that particular medium right now isn't where cus those customers are listening. They are going to be listening to their peers. So Absolutely. going to their peers is yeah. where you're going to be able to convert customers okay. easier than through the, the channel they are now. Okay. So Absolutely. there, I think, was a time in the service industry. And I think- And there may still be some. And I know. think previously- um, you know, prior to right now, like during COVID, where people were just like, I don't really know who to go to. It's so uncertain. I just want someone to do a really good job. Yeah. And all of that was more relative than right now to relationship is important. How I spend my money is important. And especially a service-based industry specifically, you either really don't care who does it and you're just looking for fast and convenient, yeah. or you really, 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 really care who does it. And you'll almost overpay because you just have such a relationship with that person that it just, you have blinders on almost. Well, and the thing is, and you're absolutely right, because those are the people, one, somebody's, one of them's going to buy Natty Ice and the other one's going to buy Sam Adams or, you know, something that's more craft beer. You have a very different, so if you try to convince the Natty Ice guy to, you know, upgrade, the likelihood that that's going to happen is very slim to none. And, you know, if that guy's been drinking, you know, Sam Adams, or whatever it is for 20 years, is he going to change? Probably not. Unless he's, he's not going to he's not going to change from a Sam Adams rep or right. a Coors Light rep, but he might right. change from his friend suggesting yeah. that he tr tries that particular. Yeah, that's exactly. a very interesting point. Okay, yeah. that's a very, very, very interesting point. 
And I, I think that when you're talking about service-based businesses, it's finding, obviously you have the internet, but you know, there's other ways of doing promotions. There's other ways of getting in front of people with something that's different, that's maybe a little bit disruptive. Maybe it's funny. Maybe it's more entertaining. Maybe it's not just, here's what I do and here's how I solve your problem. But you know, when I think about landscaping, um, I'm horrible with names, but I, I love plants and I, what's behind me is real. I haven't killed it yet. Um, so, but that's the thing, you know, you've got to look at like, what's, it's not just the solution that you provide for a problem. It's the outcome on the other side. So when I think about like luxury landscaping, I think about these amazing videos of like these insanely manicured yards or, you know, these tropical gardens or all of these things are like, oh my God, I really want to have that because that's such a cool experience. You know, it, do, why, why do we hire pest control people, right? Hire pest control people because we want to get rid of the bugs. Why? Because we want our house to be nice and clean and not have our guests freak out, you know, because a cockroach crawls across the red carpet at the Met Gala. So, you know, there's that, but that's the thing. It's understanding, okay, what does the customer really want? That's a different choice versus something that's, you know, more of a, you know, extra expenditure type of a thing where you're looking at, okay, I don't have to have this. I could just have any random come and mow my lawn, but he could also completely trash it, basically, you know, cut it too short, overwater it, under fertilize it. Next thing you know, I've got chinch bugs and the whole dang thing's dead. And so I love I have, my, a, my I have, I have an idea. I have yeah. an I have an idea. I want to run it by you. It just came through my head while I'm while we're on this. So we're in a service-based company. One of our companies is a tree company, and we have a pretty strong marketing campaign in place where we get lots of referral. We get lots of leads from residential, commercial, and HOA people who yeah. are either directly finding us from online. Uh, we're doing email campaigns directly to a group of people, and or um, pay per click or just referrals. Plus, we've obviously have been in business now for a long time, also too, and we just have our our own internal customers. Sure. So I was thinking, I'm like, you know, we're talking about how, where people are listening right now um, and the leads coming in are at a normal conversion rate. You don't get every single customer. Obviously your, con your referral customers, you have a higher conversion rate than just someone who's calling in looking for an estimate for our particular service. So I was thinking here as a business owner, how can you help internally get customers to refer? So I'm like, you know, maybe it would be a good idea to maybe have somebody additional in the office or someone to motivate someone in the office, particularly to get people to refer people after we finish work yeah. to uh, other people and maybe even give us their numbers or do something along those lines. How could I make that work? Because we have such a large database of customers. What would be the best way to motivate our staff and motivate the customer to want to continue to refer us? So you give them treats basically like what would be something that a service company like a tree company would do right. you're not going to give a tree you don't you don't want to offer you know buy one get one second limb you know lopped off you know that, that's not really no, exciting no 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 right no. that's not exciting so i think that obviously you got to look at you know what's your roi on every new customer so that's one of the big things is to get x amount of leads i've got to reach x amount of people to get out of those leads x amount of customers what is it going to take me? And then what kind of a job is that going to land me? So if I do these numbers and I run this, this is potentially what that's going to net me. Because one of the big things that we as service providers like to totally freak out on is spending money on a lot of times, not every service, not every owner is that way, but things that we don't necessarily see an immediate tangible benefit. But the thought process for me would be, okay, what's on brand that would maybe be a little cool, interesting, fun, Again, I don't know your customer demographic. I would encourage you to look at that first to kind of drill them down and figure out, okay, what do these people potentially really want? Amazon gift cards, everybody does that. But that's a really good way to say, hey, do you know a friend? Because if you know a friend and you put a time limit on it, like you know, within the next seven days, if you know anybody that needs our services that could benefit from us, you know, refer them over, you've got your collection process, um, trying to think retailer that does a, a really good job with some of their incentives, not anything in your space, but Tijuana Flats has a really good loyalty program, but it's basically, Hey, do X, Y, Z in seven days and you'll get something free. It could be maybe Amazon gift card. Isn't really fun. Partner up with a local cookie company 
and say, hey, you know, we're going to basically send you a dozen of these X, Y, Z if you do this within. But the thing is, you've got to find out what does the customer really want? There's something they want that is not necessarily something they'd spend money on for themselves, but it will trigger them to behave in a way that you're looking for. But the so question what about, is- What about this idea? Another idea popped in my head, right? So- you know, obviously, if it's a reoccurring customer, you don't have an acquisition cost associated with it technically. And even the ones that we do do work for is like, should we literally put together like a gift basket that's like $15 that just says like, you know, thank you so much. We hope that you're happy with our service and we're really looking forward to continue to spread our brand awareness. And if you could please refer us, you know, someone that you're friends with that would like our service, we really would appreciate it. And yeah. give what? And give a coaster. Like legitimately a, a gift basket. Like legit, uh, like you spend $15 on a gift basket. No, but you could also do a gift basket where, do you do water something bottle. with your the name of your company on them? You know, like a water bottle of this. Or that. You can. Um, I think it needs to be an offering that it almost makes you feel like you need to do something with it. That's you can't so just out give of people it. like chocolate. Some people are diabetic. You can't just give people nuts. Some people don't like salt. You can't get like- right. But if you literally got a gift basket that had- a, a, a water bottle, a popcorn, yeah. a chocolate, uh, whatever, but it's like a cute little gift basket. That's clearly a thank you message. Yeah. I feel like would that potentially create more raving fans that that would spread the word? It, let me put it this way. There's, there's a company, um, they're, they're not a client of mine, so I'm not going to name them. Uh, but there is a cookie company right now on LinkedIn that is primarily working as a gifting option for SaaS companies and they are killing it on both sides because it's a tech company. It's boring. It's like super expensive. And it's one of those things where you're like, is it, what am I going to get? Okay. Amazon gift card sits in my wallet. I don't use it for a year, blah, blah, blah. Well, instead of that, when they get a you know warm lead on the phone or they're trying to get to a warm lead, they're literally sending a box of cookies. Do they know if that person's diabetic? Do they know if they're allergic to chocolate? No, they don't know. You can also send a gift card Probably a little less. No, it less needs to be like a th- it, uh, To me, I feel like it needs thing. to be a thing. And I feel like, you know, you can make gift baskets relatively inexpensive. Yeah. But like the fact of it's like a whole thought out something, I think is really, I don't know. I'm just trying to think what of is, how, well, how you how, can. How local, like how locally focused, like is your brand just in the Palm Beach area? Is it all over no, Florida? It's in all of South, it's in all of South Florida. Okay. It's from like Jupiter to South Miami. So it's pretty wide range. It's pretty, pretty big range of geographic area. I think it's a good idea, John. I actually have some other thoughts about that. I think, I think that thought. doing something, especially if you could tie it into something that's local, maybe something that's not a big mass produced brand, that way they feel like, hey, you're supporting other local businesses. You could even collect, we've done this, we've done virtual Venus. It's actually really fun as part of the giveaway in order to keep people on the on the live for longer we've we've placed every 15 minutes we would do a local giveaway so we'd say hey basically go buy your wines we're going to do your wine tasting right um and i'm a sommelier so a lot of times i'd end up leading or the brand would end up leading but we'd go through the wines and we'd say okay you know go ahead go buy your wines and we ended up taking one of her brands from i think six retailers to 32 in a month in one city because they're like all of our customers keep asking for these virtual vino but then within that, in addition to, hey, go taste these wines, we've got all this drive-by traffic coming by, right? So we said, if you're viewing and you're on at these markers throughout the hour, we're going to do a giveaway from, and I think somebody did wine glasses. There was a stereo company that was like, hey, we're giving away like $2,000 like home stereo system, which is crazy. But they got tons and tons and tons of eyeballs on it because they integrated other businesses. And it was a promo for those businesses. So they donated the items for free. But the primary brand, the lead, the hero was the wine brand. And it's just getting creative with things like that. You can do pop-up food trucks, you know. What you is, so what, I have another idea here. Okay. This is just, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm brainstorming here. Okay. I'm using you. <laughs> so, I hope readers and, and or viewers and listeners like this because this is cool. This is cool. Well, I'd listen, I, so our show is really based upon, you know, how sometimes people who are professionals in each one of these industries that we interview people, they speak in a certain manner that might not creatively, you know, speak to people. So I like to like really pull things apart and give like exact examples. And it might relate to our business, 
but at the same time, it's organic flows of just, you know, creating new thoughts and ideas yeah. and how you come up with ideas. Like they just, yeah. you just got to keep so like so what was your stuff next? out there. What was your next? Thing? All right. So my next unbelievably good idea. Well, you'll let me know. Okay. Uh, our tree company gets a lot of, of leads coming in. So I feel like there's a way maybe we could increase our conversion and or customer satisfaction. It's a little bit easier. So another one of our companies is Dias Brothers Landscape Services. And um, we have a very loyal customer base, but I wouldn't say we have raving fans in the customer base where they're just referring us like crazy to all of their They're friends. happy with the services because they keep us, but John is saying they don't actively refer us. So I was thinking maybe we could send a summer package to all of our customers as a thank you and then have a little note on the inside as an aside and saying we're looking to grow and would like for you to help us spread the word. If you refer us a new customer that signs up, you can receive up to 10% off of your first off of one month service. That, I mean, if they're already customers, why not? Why not? So I feel That's like great. It's, you send great it idea. as a summer package and a thank you so much. And then like, if you choose to read the information on the inside, it's going to say what are asking. Like the primary message is thank you. Our secondary message is you know, help us, you know, grow and we would like reward you for it. Yeah, it's a great and that's idea. Something, that's something that you can use ongoing. I mean, my hairdresser gives me, you know, VIP coupons to give out, which I, you don't even have to physically give them out. I referred somebody on Facebook, but basically if I, if someone hears about his, his services and he's expensive, which is fine, I get 30% off of my next haircut. I've mentioned him a few times just in passing on Facebook and I walk in to the salon and he's like, oh, by the way, you got a bunch of free haircuts waiting for you. Okay, that's cool. That also makes my husband happy because he doesn't like me spending an insane amount of money on my hair, but I do it anyway. I think so. this is this is different though when you're thinking of marketing for everyone. It's not the like I'm trying to avoid the reoccurring nature of what people do where it's like, oh, you're getting a gift basket for Christmas. Yes. Like it gets lost in translation. I think that some people expect it, you know, you get it from an attorney or a doctor or whatever. And it's just part of the standard practice, but I don't think yeah. that it holds much water. I think that doing something like this to where, especially at unusual times going into the summer, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, well, where it's unusual for your industry is areas that I think uh, we are definitely going to try to explore to see if we can leverage, you know, some of the... I think it's smart. And uh, what it makes me think of is a long time ago, I had told you, John, about... Maybe we should. A, a smart person surrounds himself with people. Smarter people. Yeah. Right? So That's it me. reminds me That's of, me, by the way, it reminds me of a long time ago, I had thought of yeah. doing something where it was not like a coupon book, like you would dress but up. like you had said, a George up. Washington wig. No, no, no. Listen, seriously, where it was. Hey, he gets on TikTok. I can't guarantee you that thing's That's not going right. to be viral. So uh, I mean, it could blow yeah. up. Yeah. No, but like you said, like, you know, you ally yourself with some other businesses in the area. So the thing is, we happened, we started a networking group in one of our areas that we, uh, is very important to us, one of our important markets. Yeah. And there are people in that group that have all these different businesses. And I'm not saying you say, oh, I'm going to do like an advertising book where everyone gives like an advertisement about it, but you can come up with something to say, we are affiliated with these other professionals in the area. It's a way for everyone in the group to get into, for people to see them that normally may not know who they are or see them in a new way. And us to also show them, hey, look, look what we come with. These are all the different people that we do business with. These are all the different people that we talk to. We are a business that's all about the community. This is, a, we also have a so me, we also, hold on, John, we also have a um, charity that we get involved with. So this oh. is a charity that we're also involved with. So, you know, we're like a really, uh, you're, you live in this community, you live on this island, we are a big part of the fabric of it. This is what goes on. Yeah. So your idea actually could work. So remember, we were saying before, uh, yeah. when I was like, you know, maybe we should have like an advertise, like a, like a booklet, we can give our customers, like, oh, hi. So I got to catch you up here. Okay. And then yeah. I'll give you my opinion on that because I have experience in that space. But yes, yeah. So on. Jeff created a group. It's called Top of Mind Business Professionals. They're all elite professionals that are in the Palm Beach area that only primarily service the island of Palm Beach. So it's about 12 or 15 people that are in the group. And they're all the top, 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 top people in the group. So I was thinking about what we're saying here. I'm like, you know, maybe what the idea is, everyone's going away for the summer now. When they come back, all of us should pool all of our customer lists together and we all send like, you know, everyone pulls the money together. 
everyone sends the same package with the same messaging saying that we're all together to all the people. So for example, 300 people all at the exact same time on the island all get this information all at the exact same time that this person's connected with this person, this person's connected with this person, they're all together, so on and so forth. And because it's, you know, there's only probably a couple thousand houses that are actually on the island. Sure. So it's a very small group of people. So yeah. maybe that would be the way to actually get to increase customer awareness is by creating buzz by doing something all at one time. That would be, in my opinion, a, a wiser use of resources if you have relationships like that. Now, going back to the coupon book concept, I am not a fan of that because you're basically Grouponing yourself. So, yeah, I wouldn't want to do a coupon. It's just years ago, good. I wanted to do a coupon. And it book. used this to is, work. And it used to this be. This is more like an advertising. Well, I think right. if you thing, do the tying in the charity and that we right. all like it's this is a very specific market because it's right. like everyone that is sort of well known in that area all together. Do you know yes. what I mean? Yeah. So, no, I know it well. My husband grew up in PGA National. So I, you know, I definitely, I definitely know that that space. So Something to think about, especially if you're talking about integrating the chari charitable aspect of it. Most businesses forget this, but well, this was statistics from years ago, but back in, I want to say 2014, 2015, they were saying 70% of people will actually choose a brand knowing that they are doing good over a competitor. That number has gone up and up and up. So putting that out there is, is number one. But I think if you have a pool of funds to work with, and you have a group of people that are willing to support this, what I would love to see happen, and I know how Palm Beach works, I mean, my, that's, it's a very, like you said, it's a very tight-knit community. Think about doing a pop-up. Think about doing an event of some sort, whether it's one event or a series of events that's giving back in some capacity. Maybe it's a traveling event. Maybe it's so something- We're going to be doing that with a, we're gonna be doing that with a charity. Cool. So that's yeah. that's perfect. And finding ways to do that, even in, in micro- so, no, but maybe what she's saying though is what you do still though is you got a couple a couple of things all at one time to create a massive amount of awareness like so a month do, of pop-ups i mean think about if you hired a food like you, truck to go out and you know basically you wrap the food truck with something cool you know whether it's you as the, as the hero business or someone else i would imagine it should be you guys if this is your idea and you're coming up with this wrap a food truck go out do something fun i got it so okay. You do for the pop event up event is perfect. And what you do is you do the welcome, like some sort of welcome package to them. You explain to them what we're doing. You explain to them the charity that we're involved with. And then you actually get the charity involved to do a pop up event to create yep. awareness. Yep. So there's connection to a charity, there's connection to somebody that lives on the island that's part of the charity. Yep. And there's these group of companies that are behind this particular charity yes. and you make it, hopefully, if you connect with, for example, 300, you pick 300 of the best candidates, hopefully that 300 could turn into a thousand people that they end up connecting into and they tell a couple of their friends sure. and then it actually could turn into something, but you spend, I don't know, $50 each particular gift. So it might be a good amount of money, but it could create a lot of awareness and a lot of buzz. Yeah. Like a family, a family fun day yeah, or even like pop three, up, you know, micro, like micro versions of that. And here's what a lot of people, people forget. times 50 bucks is $15,000. So yeah. $15,000 cost. I like the idea. You and here's something else I want you to, I want you to remember. And I don't know how, I don't know the stations down in Palm beach, but I know this works up here. Most radio stations will give you free airtime. If you're doing a charity event. Hmm. They will give you free airtime. So, and I don't mean the charity necessarily alone. I'm talking Jeff and Jonathan can get free airtime on the radio if you're doing something that's actually for charity. Now okay. you've got an opportunity to talk about the event. You can talk about what you're passionate about. You start tying in your brand values, right? You start tying in the things that you care about. And at the end, your host, your announcer, your interviewer is going to basically, okay, so who are you guys? What do you do? And you basically got a free ad. So, you know, to me, that's the power of, integrating these things and sharing your values and sharing why it is something. What is your why as right. a business? What right. is each individual business's why? You know, and if you don't want it to be your personal, what is the business's why? You know, if you want to be separate, you know, some people are introverts. They don't want to be out necessarily in front of the business. This is kind of a, a we're in the day and age where if you are not a face, you're going to 
the fighting competitors because right? they're willing to do that. They're right. willing. That's right. And if you're not, I think this would be a good idea, though. Yeah. I think this is like a, a. Yeah, this was great talking to you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. How I, do people I, get in touch with you? So uh, they can find me on LinkedIn. Just search for Cassandra Rosen. I am the one and only that will come up first on that. Um, I am on Instagram at Cassandra L. Rosen. If you want to reach me via email, it's crosen at fkint.com. But usually LinkedIn is one of the best places to find me because I'm there. That is my community. And for serious businesses, like that's where Jonathan and I connected. That is an incredibly powerful network. So I'm happy to meet you guys. And I, you got to tell me what happens with this event. If you guys end up putting, putting it oh, together. Sure. Absolutely. I love the collaborative effort that we have together here, putting it together. And I hope we added lots of value to everyone listening by kind of, you know, get the creative juices going, start thinking of creative ways that you can apply it towards your business. That's why I wanted to break down a couple different options because sometimes you really hit roadblocks where you're like, I don't know how to do it. And you really have to get really creative to how you can connect your to the exact customer you're looking to connect with, because yeah. that is the most important part. Not most people don't have everyone as their customer. You know what I mean? They have a very specific market, whether it's low, middle, high, like each one, in, or if they have a certain area of a city, you know, these are all really important things um, to touch on. So it, we really, I was, it was a yeah. great call today. And we appreciate having you here today. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Appreciate you guys. And it was a great time. Absolutely. Tell me what you Thank again. you. All right. This has been the Cultivating Success Podcast with Jeff Sofer and Jonathan Wolfson. To learn more about Jeff and Jonathan and their businesses, visit www.naturesexperts.com.